Welcome back to Tom's World Skill Model Series. In this installment, we embark on the construction phase of our Timia Cumfoggin 38T. If you enjoy programming on scale modeling, then show your support by subscribing to this channel. Leave us a comment, like, dislike, or share the video with friends. Clicking the notification bell gives you alerts when we post new content. Or visit the channel Tom's World for a friendly visit for a complete list of all our videos. Our prior unboxing episode revealed another quality offering from Tamiya. Inside the box we found clear instructions and the superb molding and detail we've come to expect from the brand. The contained figure looks great and we even found a photo edge grill cover in the box. The kit's content suggested another worry-free project and I was eager to get started. Stick with us as we cover the build step by step from the tools and materials we'll need, the kit's strength and weaknesses, to final construction and preparation to painting. So let's get on to the building. To get started, we work on a good quality cutting mat and our workspace is brightly lit. Our parts must first be removed from the sprues then we'll have to do some additional cleanup. Just a few basic tools are needed for part preparation. This includes sprue cutters, knives with fresh blades, and sanding sticks and various grits. By way of a building tip, it's a good idea to buy your hobby blades in bulk. Purchased in 100 packs like this, the blades cost around 30 to 35 cents each. If bought in 3 or 5 packs, the price can run as high as $1.80 each. Replace your blades at the first hint of dullness or if the sharp point breaks off. Sharp blades produce clean cuts and are ideal for smoothing and planing surfaces. I also set aside a small sealable plastic bag. I can store my loose parts securely and protect them from dust, dander and pet hair. Once removed from the sprue, we always want to closely inspect our parts. We're looking for damage, warps, and other imperfections. We're also looking for knockout scars. These appear as perfectly round raised or sunk circles which are left by the rods that push the parts out of their molds. All styrene models have them. We're looking for the knockouts that are visible once the model is assembled. To me, a kit engineers usually do a good job of hiding the knockouts, but always be on the lookout for them as sometimes they can be very small. The hull pieces look good and the outside surfaces are clean and free of scars. We use our knives to trim the sprue gates. I use several cuts to clean up the gates. If we use a single cut right by the part, the blade pressure can create stress cracks and pits on the part. That's why I cut a little away from the part. I then use a slicing action with my knife, leaving a little bump where the gate was. To finish, I use a sanding stick. I start with the coarse side, then I finish with the finer side. Our parts must be smooth and once painted should show no evidence of the sprue gates. The newer Tamiya armor kits feature built-up hulls. Gone are the simplified bathtub style hulls typical of older Tamiya kits. Our hull builds up with 12 parts including the PE engine grille. And here are most of the hull parts cleaned up and laid out ready for assembly. Tamiya gives us this thick cross member with excellent pin and slot joints. This piece drops in perfectly. It stiffens our hull and ensures the side pieces and floor are square and true. The hull sides and floor also have key joints and raised brackets run the length of the floor. In our dry fit the parts literally fell together. Tamiya is renowned for its kit engineering and all the attention they pay to the joinery really makes the kits a joy to build. The parts interlock and the fit is absolutely foolproof. A few solvents and glues are required for plastic model construction. To attach plastic to plastic, we use so-called model glue or cement. 
but these aren't actually glues or cements, they're actually a solvent. They melt the plastic and literally weld the pieces together. It's nasty stuff, so work in a well-ventilated space. Many brands of model cement are available and which you use is really just a matter of preference. More important is to have a couple of thicknesses of glue. I keep a thick bodied version in my kit. I can dab and spread it on with a toothpick. This thin blend of cement comes in handy too. The bottle has a lid mounted brush. It's ideal for long seams since we can brush the cement on. Because of its thin consistency, capillary action draws it evenly into the joints. We'll need very few tools to build up this model. A small finger clamp or two, toothpicks for smearing on our thick body glue, elastic bands to hold parts while gluing them, tweezers for handling those pesky small parts, and a pin vise with a small assortment of tiny drill bits. As predicted, the hull parts fell together perfectly. I used a few rubber bands to hold everything tight while the glue dried, but the fit is so good that the bands are likely unnecessary. The result is factory finished seals, no filler needed here. The fit is so good that even younger and first time builders will have no problems getting flawless seams. Our suspension is attached next. To me it gives us a light build up with the leaf springs and axles as separate pieces. The leaf springs are keyed to the chassis so they drop in effortlessly. The parts are all self aligning. The axles come next. We want to make sure they're pressed tightly into the little cups at the end of the leaf springs. The drive sprockets are also keyed which eases their alignment. There are knockout depressions on the inside of the sprocket so either sand them out or hide them with weathering. Each of the running wheels has a molded parting line or burr. We clean these up with a sanding stick. To avoid flat spots, we follow the contour of the wheel. And here's the finished look. It's important to clean up all of our parts. This ensures the parts fit tightly and look as realistic as possible. Contest judges look for imperfections, so the extra work really pays off if we plan to enter our model in a show. Three bins get attached to the vehicle and they're built up with several parts. The parts fit perfectly, but we want to make sure when assembling them that we press the pieces tightly together to remove any gaps. That way we get nice square edges. The Grouser bin, Jack and Jerry cans build up with a minimum of parts. Note the Jerry can lids. These are some of the smallest parts in the kit, so care must be taken when working with them. The Jerry cans look great with their molded on straps, indented leathering and delicate handles. If you're still not convinced how well the parts in this kit fit together, watch how nicely the lid falls into place on the perforated grouser bin. The molding is so good that none of the holes in the bin actually required any cleanup. The antenna mounting bracket in this kit is a bit of an oddity, and to me at kits it's usually obvious how parts go together. In this case the part is mounted at a 45 degree angle. The back of the part isn't shaped perfectly and the slot it fits into is loose. A little fiddling is required to get it on properly. It does look like an unnatural add-on, perhaps a modification the Germans made when they added a radio to the Czechoslovakian vehicle. This part which sits behind the Notec light also looks out of place and I believe it's the housing for the brake cooling assembly. It kind of gets plopped onto the fender as if it were an afterthought. There are subtle ridges on the fender to help the alignment but unlike other parts in the kit it doesn't naturally fall into place. Care must be taken when installing this part. The molding on the two B's on machine guns is amazing, but the barrels are solid so we have to hollow them out. To do this we use a pin vise using a bit that's just smaller than the diameter of the barrel. Another tricky assembly are these fender brackets or stiffeners. These little alligator clamps are very handy for model building and they're perfect for getting these brackets on. I use them to clamp the brackets and fenders together. I then very carefully brushed on some thin cement along the seams. We want to make sure there are no gaps between the brackets, fenders and hull in order to replicate how the brackets sit on the actual vehicle. Next comes the turret. 
Older Tamiya tank kits usually come with a precast turret, but this kit requires us to build it up. Six parts constitute the major structure. Here are the parts with the mantlet, all cleaned up and ready for assembly. Like the hull, the turret builds up using keyed butt joints. There are ample gluing surfaces and alignment brackets are molded into the sides. This gives us strong joint surfaces. It's practically impossible to misalign the parts, which makes assembly foolproof. It's long seams like these where our thin cement really comes into its own. We simply pinch the pieces together tightly and brush the cement along the seam. Capillary action draws the solvent into the seam. It tacks up in about 30 seconds, but give it a couple of hours to dry fully. The assembly was easy and the fit is spectacular. No clamps or even elastic bands are needed to build up this turret. I'm leaving the turret roof off for now since the cupola and turret interior will need painting, but dig the fit. It's the same story with the mantlet. Even when dry fitted, the parts give us tight realistic plate seams. This is a much easier assembly than our recent FT-17 build, where we encountered compound mutter joints and precious few key or alignment aids. If there is a knock on Tamiya kits, it's a lack of clear parts. For example, our 38T kit gives us these solid styrene periscopes. They're adequate, but I would have preferred if these parts were cast clear. I built a Dragon Martyr several years ago, and the kit came with clear cast periscopes. I hold it out of the display case to have a look. This style of clear periscopes can be painted to get a very realistic look. Over the years I've encountered a few Tamiya kits which were wanting for clear parts and I hope the company considers adding them to their kits. To the credit of Czechoslovak designers, the 38T has a towering cupola. The Tamiya kit builds up this prominent feature with several parts. At first glance the assembly seems a little daunting, but like other joinery in the kit, these parts fall together effortlessly. The vision slots on the cupola are hollow and I think clear periscopes would have looked great here. Although the figure obstructs a clear view of the inside of the cupola, the added detail clear scopes would have provided, I think, would have definitely improved this assembly. Speaking of the figure, he looks great. The seams on his body parts are tight and likely require no filler. His pose is exquisite and mounting him on the finished piece will definitely lift the model and add to its visual appeal. There are a couple of sink marks on the inside of the commander's hatch. No problem if you mount the figure since he covers these. But if you decide not to use the figure and you want to pose the hatch open, these sink marks will have to be filled. Overall, the model is simple to assemble, but there are quite a few tiny bits and bobs to attach to the hull. The muffler brackets, towing hooks, smoke dispenser, no tech distant light, aiming reticule, and this formation light are examples. Make sure these parts are installed straight and true. Most tanks have many Pioneer tools attached to their hull, but this little vehicle only has this single long pry bar. The little claw at the end is cast solid, so I took the time to clean up the space between the claws. The cleaned up version looks much more realistic. Time to attach our lone PE piece. We use cyanoacrylate, commonly referred to as CA or crazy glue, to attach metal to plastic. CA comes in various thicknesses and this medium bodied version is a good all around adhesive for model building. CA glue is unforgiving and once the part is attached it's pretty much stuck on. The part is a good side so we want to make sure we put the good side up. I use a little bit of our poster tack to temporarily stick the PE onto a toothpick and I rehearse the move several times to build up a little muscle memory and confidence. It's amazing how shaky one's hands get when the camera is rolling. I'll attach the part off camera since it's hard to work around the camera when it's a couple of inches away from the model. Take your time and practice the move a few times dry. Then we apply the CA, hold our breath and plop the part on. Time to turn our attention to the tracks. The track loops are not side specific, that is the right and left sides are identical. However, we do have to make sure the tracks run in the correct front to back direction. As long as we align the top sag to the return rollers, it's almost impossible to get the direction wrong. The overall shape of the track loop also prohibits installing the runs backwards. To assemble the tracks, I attach a short run of masking tape sticky side up to my mat. I can then place the individual track links together and the tape holds them in place. A straight edge ensures the links are properly aligned. 
I press the links firmly together so the joints are tight. I can then press the accompanying length of track to the end of my little run. Using our thin cement, we brush on a generous coating over all the loose joints. No need to be fastidious, just a good smear is all it takes. Capillary action pulls the thin glue into all the joints, making this type of track assembly fast and easy. I dry fit the wheels to the hull and while the track run is still pliable, I wrap it around the wheels. I'm not gluing the wheels to the hull and the track is not glued to the wheels at this point. The wheels simply act as a guide for the track to settle onto, so the track run holds its final shape as the glue dries fully. We simply repeat the process for the lower track run. Once the track is placed, I jam little rolls of paper towel to wedge the tracks against the wheels. We let this dry for at least two hours or until the tracks are fully hardened. Since I want to remove the tracks and wheels to paint and weather them, I broke the tracks here and here. I can then remove the wheels and tracks for painting and weathering. This also allows me to get at the lower hull to paint and weather it as well. Although the instructions call for the fenders to be installed after the tracks are in place, I glued the fenders on first. This eases painting and weathering later. And in case you're wondering, there is enough room to install the tracks even if the fenders are placed first. With our major sub-assemblies complete and the rest of our parts cleaned up, we're ready for painting. Some builders prefer fully building their models before painting, but I prefer pre-painting some parts before final assembly. This gives me more control and I don't have to contort my hand to get a brush into impossible places. So far the build was easy and fun. Notwithstanding the antenna mount and the bullhorn oddity on the front fender, I found myself marveling at the kit's engineering throughout the build. The parts look great and once painted and weathered, the finished vehicle should be fantastic. And that'll do it for this part one of our Tamiya Panzer 38 build. Check back real soon for part two where we'll look at painting and weathering our latest creation. Please subscribe to the channel, leave a like, dislike, or comment below the video. Or visit my channel Tom's World for a complete library of all our scale model and game design videos. Thank you for joining me and as always, keep building, stay well, and all the best.